to listen and hopefully be able to learn something new and apply it to our lives. Father, we uh, continue to ask you to please be with those who are sick, especially those who are sick of our number here. We pray that they will be able to be back with us uh, at the next point in time to be here with us. And Father, we just pray for those who have lost loved ones, especially for the Chambers family. We just pray that you'll please be with them and, and help them for this time. We just ask you to please go with us throughout this study and forgive us when we do wrong. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. We are studying Old Testament characters. We are in the book of 2 Kings. <clears throat> Ready? We're in, actually in chapter 6. Uh, we talked very quickly about chapter 6 last week. I want to go back over it. Uh, we uh, uh, very hurriedly, just in the last minute or two, covered that chapter. Uh, we've been studying about Elisha. Uh, we talked about the fact that Elijah really is recognized as the greater prophet. And yet, Elisha uh, performed, at least what is recorded, a whole lot more miracles than Elijah did. Uh, and there's really more given to us about Elisha and his life than it is about uh, Elijah. Uh, and yet, Elijah represents the prophets, and he is the great prophet uh, by Jewish uh, thinking. Uh, and most scholars would say the same thing, that Elijah was the great prophet of the Old Testament. Uh, and yet Elisha is, is the one that did so many miracles. How do we account for the fact that he did so many miracles? Okay. He had, uh, before Elijah died, uh, Elijah asked him what he would ask for, and he said he would like to have a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Uh, and he's, of course, that's the Holy Spirit that Elijah had. And he said, I want a double portion. And Elijah said, well, if you see me go up into heaven, uh, then you can have that. And so he did. He saw when Elijah was taken up by a whirlwind, uh, he was one of two men that is given to us in the Bible that did not die. Uh, but he was taken up in a whirlwind. And uh, and Elisha saw that, and Elijah's coat fell down. Uh, and you remember when he came back across the Jordan uh, River, he took the coat and he asked God to part the water, and he hit the water with the coat, and the water parted, and he went across on dry land. So that's the first miracle that he performed. And, and the other prophets, there's about 50 prophets, saw that happen. And so they, they understood that Elisha was the official prophet, and then all these other prophets were under him. Uh, and so we, we studied by Elisha. And this really goes all the way back to chapter 2 where all this takes place. And, and then we talked about the various miracles that he performed. In chapter 6, the, the prophets uh, told Elisha, they said, our house is too cramped. There's too many people living in this house. We need to build a bigger house. And so uh, they said, well, let's go down to the River Jordan. And if it's okay with you, then we're going to go down there. We're going to cut down timbers. We're going to build a bigger house. And Elisha said, that sounds good. Go for it. And they said, well, would you go with us? And he said, sure, I'll go with you. So we went and uh, they started cutting timbers. And one of the prophets was cutting a timber with an axe. And the axe head came off of the handle and went into the river. And so he cried out to Elisha and he said, it was borrowed. It was not mine. Uh, and I've lost it. And so Elisha cut a stick, and he said, where did it go? And he told him, and so he took the stick and he threw it where he said the axe head went, and the axe head floated. And the guy just reached out and got it. Uh, so that, that's always been an interesting miracle. And this is one of those, there, there's some of them that he did that seemed to have purpose. This one is one of those that doesn't really seem to have any specific purpose other than just recording the fact that he did it. Uh, showing the the power that God had given him. Uh, all right, any any question or comment on that or any of the uh, down through that part? We're down uh, verse eight now. The king of Syria decided that he was going to go to battle against Israel. So he made his battle plans 
and said, this is where we're going to go. And we're going to attack Israel at this place. Elisha sent word to the king of Israel and said, the king of Syria is going to come down and fight against you at this place at this time. And so he sent some scouts over and sure enough, the king of Syria was coming so he didn't go. Uh, and then it happened again. And it happened a third time. And it says it just says it happened uh, more than two or three times. So I don't know how many times it happened. If you were king, and every time you made battle plans to go against somebody, and you got there, they knew about it, what would you think? <laughs> okay, we got a spy in the camp. And this is exactly what the king of Syria thought. He called his people together. He said, okay, who is it here that's against me and for the king of Israel? And one of his men said, said, no, my Lord, it's not anybody here that's doing it, but it's the prophet Elisha. And he knows what you say in your bedroom. <laughs> even if you privately plan something and don't even tell anybody, he's going to know it. Uh, and so they said, well, where can he? King said, well, where can we find him? And they said, well, he's at uh, such and such a place now and uh, let's see. He's in Dothan. Okay, verse 13. It said he's in Dothan. So he sent a huge army of horses and chariots and, and horsemen and all of these, these soldiers, and they go down there to Dothan to take Elisha. Well, the next morning, Elisha's servant got up real early. And he looked out and he saw this huge army circling the city. And he was scared to death. And he told Elisha uh, what was going on. And, and so Elisha said, well, don't worry about it. And so he, he, Elisha prayed and he said, open the eyes of my servant so he can see. And when he did, the hills and all around them were filled with horses and chariots of fire. In other words, these were angelic beings. And so he, uh, they came down, and when they did, Elisha prayed, rather than destroying them, Elisha prayed that they would all go blind. And so the whole Syrian army went blind. So Elisha went out to him, and he said, well, you're at the wrong place. He said, if you're looking... For Elisha and you looking for the city of Dothan, you're at the wrong place. So let me take you where you want to go. And so he carried him to Samaria. Now Samaria was the capital city of Israel. The northern Israel, the northern tribes. So he carried them there and carried them inside the city. And then when they got inside the city, he prayed to God that they could get their sight back and all of a sudden they could see again. Well then they were all taken captive by the king of Syria. So the king of Syria asked Elisha, said, should I kill them? And he said, would you kill people that you took prisoner of war in a battle? And he said, no. And he said, well, then don't. He said, feed them. Give them something to eat and give them some water to drink and send them back home to their master. And so that's exactly what they did. And, and so it says then that they uh, didn't come again for a while to the, the land of Israel. Uh, you'll find uh, Syria, uh, and or some, some translations call it Aram, A-R-A-M, uh, but you'll see all through this section that they're constantly coming down and fighting against Israel, just one, one after another. And there's like three or four kings of Israel and three or four kings of Syria, but they just keep fighting against each other. Uh, And so they, they keep coming down. Verse 24. Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, came up and besieged Samaria. Now, I find that interesting because if, if you look at verse 23, it ends by saying, the marauding bands of Syria did not come again into the land of Israel. Then the very next verse says, now the king of Syria came down and besieged Samaria. So that, that's a very temporary delay. It's a, it's a peace treaty for a very short time. Uh, and he comes down and he besieged Samaria. 
Now what happens if, if an army surrounds a city and doesn't let anybody in or out? And they just stay there. They don't, don't attack. Just don't let anybody in or out. What's going to happen? After a while, you're going to starve to death. They have no way of getting food in. I mean, you can have a certain amount of food there. And you might even have access to a little bit. But nowhere near enough. And so it, it says that, uh, that the famine was great in Samaria. So much so that a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver. Now they were, they re, were resorting to the point of eating a donkey's head just to have something to eat. But that, then it says, and a fourth of a cab of dove's dung was five shekels of silver. That's equal to about one pint. And it was selling for five shekels of silver. The king of Israel was walking through the city. And there was this woman that called out to him and saved me. He said, help me, king, help me. And he said, he said if the Lord can't help you, what can I do for you? Uh, and she said, but he, then he said, okay, what, what is your request? And this tells you how bad the siege was. She said, there was another lady, another woman here in town, and we agreed that we would kill my son and eat him today. But then when all that was gone, she would let us kill her son and we would eat him. But we killed my son and ate him, and now she has taken her son and hidden him and won't bring him for us to eat. And the king tore his clothes and put on sackcloth. He he just could not believe it had reached that point that people were actually killing their children to eat, to have, to be able to survive. Um, the king, and this is so typical, in verse 31, the king blamed Elisha for this. And I find that interesting. You got a very wicked king, you got one that serves idols, you got one that does not serve God. And Elisha is a prophet of God. And so if anything bad is happening, then it obviously is because Elisha is prophesied against them and, and God's punishing them, and so it's Elisha's fault. Uh, and so when, when things went bad, that's who they want to blame. They want to blame Elisha. Uh, and so Elisha was sitting in his house, and the king's messenger came. Uh, to Elisha, Elisha told the guy that was there in the house with him, he said, the messenger of the king's fixing to come and he's going to take my head off, so he just blocked the door and don't let him in. And so that's what they did. Uh, and so finally, uh, the, the messenger and the king came. Uh, and Elisha said, and this goes into chapter 7, he said, I want you to listen to what God says. Tomorrow, about this time, a measure of fine flour will be sold for one shekel, two measures of barley for a shekel, here in the gate of the city, the gate of the city of Samaria. Now you saw what, uh, you know, a donkey's head was selling for 80 shekels of silver. Now he's saying, you're going to have real food, and not just flour, but fine flour, and it's going to sell for one shekel. This messenger said, that's not possible. Even if God opened up the windows of heaven, that couldn't happen. Elisha said, it will happen, just like God said it will tomorrow, but you're not going to be able to eat any of it because you'll die. The next day, there were four he said, you'll see it, but you won't, you won't eat any of it. The next day, there were four lepers. And they were, of course, outside the city. They got to talking. They said, if we go stay out here, we're going to starve to death. We don't have any food. We're going to starve to death. If we go in the city, they may kill us or they may not. We may get some food. We may not. But probably we'll die. But if we go down to the Syrians 
and just turn ourselves over to them, they might kill us, but they might feed us. And at least that way we have a shot at staying alive. So let's go down to the Syrian camp and give ourselves to them, and they will take care of us maybe. And so on that slim chance that they could stay alive, they went to the Syrian camp about twilight. When they got there, there was nobody there. The camp was completely empty. But everything was left exactly like it had been when the Syrians were there. The, the, uh, the tents were open. The food was in the tents. All their stuff was there. Uh, the donkeys were still tied up outside the tents. There were horses tied up. Uh, but nobody was there. And so they went in one of the tents and started eating. And so they ate a whole bunch, and then they said, okay, let's get some stuff. And so they got some clothes and some silver and some other stuff that was there in the tent and took it and hid it. Uh, and then they came back, and they was going to get some more. And one of them said, hey, this ain't right. Well, this ought to be a day of victory for all of Israel, and here we are keeping it just for ourselves, and God will punish us for this if we don't go tell the king. So they went that night and told the king, what was going on? And the king said, yeah. He said, this is a trick. He said, I know what they're doing. The Syrians are pretending to have abandoned their camp. And then when we come out there and we go in, they're going to come up out of the woods all around us and they're going to attack us and they're going to take the city. One of the men said, look, we got a few horses left that hadn't died. said, why don't you send these horses and some horsemen out to the camp and just see what's going on. So they sent two chariots with horses and they went out to the camp and sure enough, it was just like the men said it was. And there was stuff that was strewn in one direction so they started following it and they went all the way to the River Jordan and it said it was all kinds of stuff strewn where they had just thrown it away and left it trying to flee. And what had happened is God had sent the sound of chariots and horsemen. And it sounded so like it was so many that the Syrians said, surely what has happened is they have, Israel has either hired the Egyptians uh, or he is, they've hired some other uh, big army. And as a result of that, we're fixing to be defeated. And so they had just fled. And of course, God is the one who gave them the victory. But they fled. And so Israel then, the chariot people came back. They told the king what they had found. And so Israel began to pursue them uh, and, and fought against them. Uh, and were able to take a great deal of plunder. When they came back into the city of Samaria, they had so much food that they were selling flour, a measure of fine flour for one shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel. But the guy who was the attendant of the king, the king had told him to be the gatekeeper, but the crowd was so excited and so uh, adamant about getting in and getting the food and having the food and coming and going that they trampled him to death. And so just like Elisha said what happened, he saw the flour and the barley sell for a shekel, but he did not eat any of it. He was trampled to death. All right, any question on chapter 7? All right. There, let me, let me just say this. Israel, the northern tribes, had a king named Jehoram, but sometimes he's referred to as Joram. And so it's instead of J-E-H-O-R-A-M, it's J-O-R-A-M. It's the same guy. 
Judah, the southern tribes, also had a king named Jehoram. Uh, and they had one named Joram. So when you read these names, sometimes it becomes very confusing trying to keep them straight, who's king, when, and where. Plus, as you read through this, it seems, and I'm not sure that this is 100% accurate what I'm going to say, but it seems that sometimes it's not all exactly chronological as you read through it. it it'll just talk about the king did this and the king did that, and, and then, then all of a sudden you're back to the other king and you seem to be back a few years uh, with some of the stuff that's going on. So uh, it's, it it's may be, but if it, if it is, it, it's difficult for me to, to get it all together uh, exactly as it takes place. All right, and this, this chapter 8 seems to, in fact, back up a little bit and tells you something, and then it comes back forward. Uh, you remember the woman that Elisha stayed with, and her son got sick and he died? You remember we talked about that last week? Uh, and Elisha raised him from the dead. Uh, well, Elisha told this woman, said, there's going to be a great famine. And you need to leave and go somewhere else where they're going to have some food. And stay there for, for seven years. Because this famine is going to be severe and you'll, you won't have any food if you stay here. And so she did. Uh, and she took her household. And she did according to what he said. And she went to the land of the Philistines for seven years. Well, after seven years, she came back to Israel. She went in to talk to the king. Apparently, while she was gone that seven years, somebody had taken her land. And so she came back to talk to the king to see if she could get her land back uh, now that she was back home. Uh, and let, let me back up just a minute. When God divided up Israel, when, when Israel came into the land of Canaan and they took the land and God divided it up and different tribes were given different places and just went under the, reign, under the rule of Joshua and different tribes were given different places and then within each tribe, families were given certain portions of land and their land was marked off and this, this land belonged to this family. And then after that, it was handed down to that family. And they were not allowed to sell their land to another family. Now, a family member could get it, but not to another family. If, in fact, it was sold to another family, then every 50 years, there was what was called a year of jubilee. And it was a special Sabbath year in which the land was not worked at all for the whole year, and any land that had been bought outside the family went back to that family at the year of Jubilee. So when they sold land outside the family, they calculated the price based on the number of years to the next year of Jubilee. And then it would revert back. So... And, and it was one of the things that specifically said was that uh, the, the ownership of this land was sacred. Let me just put it like that. The, the ownership of this land was sacred to that family. Now, Israel, the northern tribes, did not serve God. They served idols. They were uh, many, many of them, most of them were completely wicked people that, that didn't care about God but they still considered their land as sacred to their family. And so this was a part of their heritage as Jews that they did consider to still be a sacred thing was this, is, this belongs to us. And so when, when this woman came back to Israel, she wanted her land back because it belonged in this family. And so she would go to the king and then the king, it'd be up to the king to decide this and say okay or no. And so while she had come to the king, Elisha's servant was talking to the king, 
And, and the king said, tell me some of the things that Elisha has done. Just tell me about some of his miracles. And so the servant of Elisha is telling the king all these different miracles that, uh, they had, that Elisha had performed. And one of them was that he had raised this boy from the dead. This boy had died. Well, about that time, this woman came in to ask for her land. And the servant of Elisha said, this is the woman that Elisha raised her son from the dead. And so the king said, okay, what is it you want? And so she explained what had happened. And the king said, okay, you can have your land back. And he issued the decree and gave us the responsibility to a particular guy to go and make sure that this woman got, uh, that it was, it, the land was restored to her uh, and everything that was hers would, would be given back to her uh, and, and so it was taken care of. Again, that's uh, just one of those sort of human interest stories that's stuck in there. I don't know any real lesson in it other than it's just there. And Robert, not only did he restore the land, he also ordered them to give her the proceeds that the land had produced those seven years. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, it, was, it was her land, so whatever came off of it, she deserved to get part of it, so. She, they had to give her, pay her for what they made off of it as well. Do what? Yeah. <laughs> of course, if you're raising crops on somebody else's land, plus it probably didn't produce that much because why was she gone in the first place? Because it's a famine. Yeah. So it probably wasn't that much of it even there. Uh, but yeah, that she did. Okay. Elisha went to Damascus. The Damascus was the capital of Syria. This is where the enemy is. And so Elisha went to the capital of Syria, to Damascus. And while he was there, uh, chapter 8, verse 7. I forgot to tell you where I was. A couple of weeks ago after class, she said, it would be a whole lot easier to follow you if you tell us where you are. And I said, okay. And so I wrote down places with each story so I could tell you, and then I forgot to tell you. But chapter 8 and verse 7. Elisha came to Damascus. Ben-Hadad was king of Syria, and he was sick. And he heard that Elisha, uh, the man of God, and of course he knew about him, how did he know about Elisha? How did Ben Hadad know about Elisha? <laughs> okay, this is the guy that was telling these battle plans. He knew that he really was a man of God. Uh, not only that, uh, but earlier he had had a captain of his army uh, that had leprosy that went down, and Elijah, Elisha's predecessor, had healed him. So you got. You got a lot of things going on here uh, that he knew about him. Anyway, he recognized him as a man of God. And so he sent word. He sent his, uh, his chief uh, servant, uh, Haziel. Uh, he said, I want you to go to the man of God, take a bunch of gifts in your hand, and find out if I'm going to get well. And so he said, okay, okay. Uh, and I thought it was interesting. It says, Haziel went to verse 9. Haziel went to meet uh, Elisha. He took a gift in his hand of every kind of good thing of Damascus. And then it says, 40 camels loads. He came and stood before him. <laughs> so, I mean, he didn't just take what he carried in his hand. When he says his hands, he's talking about under his control. He took 40 camel loads of gifts to Elisha. And he said, my master is sick and he wants to know if he's going to get well. Elisha said, you go back and you tell him that he's going to get well. But he really isn't. Uh, and then Elisha just began staring at Haziel until finally Haziel 
he, he couldn't take it anymore. And uh, he, he just kept staring at him. And finally, Elisha started crying. And Haziel said, why, why are you crying? And he said, because I know the evil that you're going to do to the sons of Israel. God has declared that Ben-Hadad, your king, is going to die. You're going to be the next king of Syria. And you will bring great devastation and killing. Uh, it says you'll kill with the sword young men, uh, their little ones you'll dash in pieces. Their women with child you'll rip open. He said, I know what you're going to do to Israel. And Hazel said, I'm just a servant. How, how can I do that? And he said, the Lord has shown me that you'll be king. And so he went back and he told Ben-Hadad that you will surely recover. And then the next day, he took the cover uh, of the bed where he was, where Ben Hadad was, he dipped it in water and then he put it over his face and held it down till he died. Uh, so he suffocated the king. Uh, and so Ben Hadad became king of Syria. The Ahab's son, we talked about Ahab and Jezebel, you remember? His son was Jehoram, also known as Joram. Uh, and he was evil, uh, but there was also a king in Judah named Jehoram, um, who was the son of Jehoshaphat, and he was evil. Uh, and then Ahaziah became the next king in Judah, and he was also evil. Um, and so you have a, a number of, of wicked kings there. Uh, and then going to chapter 9. Elisha told one of the servants, he said, I want you to go... Uh, to Ramoth Gilead. And when you get there, there will be a man there named Jehu. And I want you to take a flask of oil and tell Jehu that you have something private to tell him and get him out, or it's just you and, and Jehu, and tell him that the Lord said, I have anointed you king over Israel. And you pour the oil over his head and then open the door and run. And get away just as fast as you can. And so the servant went there, and there were a number of the commanders of the king that were all gathered there, uh, captains. And Jehu came in, uh, or the servant came in, and, and he said, I have a word for you, O captain. And Jehu said, which one? Which one of us? There are several captains here. And he said, for you. And he said, okay. And so Jehu got up and went out, and he told him, Exactly what God told him to tell him. He poured the oil in his head, told him he was going to be king, and he opened the door and he fled. Now one of the things that he told him was, he said, uh, the whole house of Ahab, and it was the descendants of Ahab that were kings at the present time, he said, the whole house of Ahab will perish. I'm going to cut off from Ahab every male person, both uh, uh, bond and free. And I'll make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam that he had already destroyed and the, and the house of Basha that he had already destroyed. And he said, not only that, but the dogs will eat Jezebel. And this was the king's mother. Uh, the dogs will eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel and nobody will bury her. And so then he opened the door and he took off and he left. Uh, so when Jehu came back in where everybody was, they said, okay, what did this man have to tell you? He said, ah, oh, he's crazy. You know how these crazy people are. And he said, no, he told you something. What did he tell you? And he said, he is a prophet of God. 
And he anointed me and told me that I was going to be king and destroy the family of Ahab. And so they immediately got up and said, Jehu's our king. And so they declared him uh, to be king. Well, they gathered up some people and they headed toward uh, where uh, Joram was, King Joram. Uh, he had gone to Jezreel. To, he had been injured in battle and he had gone to Jezreel to recoup. And so Jehu and his men head toward Jezreel. When they look, they say, hey, there's somebody coming. And somebody said, well, send a messenger out. And they did. When they met up with uh, Jehu, uh, the, the messenger said, are you coming in peace? He said, what have I got to do with peace? Join me. And so he got in, in line with them. Well, the, the king said, hey, this ain't good because the messenger's not coming back. And so the watchman said, said he should just join them. And so they sent another messenger. And he did the same thing. And so then uh, the king went out uh, and, and said uh, that he would just go. So and they made his chariot ready and he went out. And uh, also King Ahaziah, who was the king of Judah, was up there with him uh, while he was recouping from his wounds. He had come to visit him. And so they both went uh, and they saw... Jehu coming. And I thought it was interesting earlier, and I sort of skipped over it at the time, but uh, the watchman reported when the second one joined uh, Jehu, he reported to the king, he says, uh, he came even to them, he did not return, but the driving of the chariot is like the driving of, the, of Jehu because he drives furiously. And so they had reckless drivers even back then with chariots. Uh, and so he's, uh, he recognized the driving of Jehu. But anyway, King Joram and uh, Ahaziah went out. Well, when they got there, uh, he said, Are you coming in peace? And Jehu said, uh, What peace so long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many? And so Joram turned around and took off to get away as quick as he could. He knew what that meant. He was fixing to be killed. And so Jehu shot an arrow uh, and it went through the back of Joram and killed him. Uh, and then he chased down Ahaziah and killed him as well. Uh, the servants of Ahaziah took him back to Jerusalem and buried him. Uh, and uh, they took Joram and put him on the land that had belonged formerly to Naboth. Because when Ahab, you remember, Stole, he had Jezebel had Naboth killed and they took his vineyard uh, because Ahab wanted it. You remember that story? Well, at that time, Elijah said that some of Ahab's descendants would be put there. And so that's where they dumped Joram, uh, the, just threw him out on the land that had formerly belonged to Naboth. Um, and it says the, that it fulfilled the prophecy that was, that was made uh, concerning Naboth. Um, they got into Jezreel and Jezebel heard what was going on. And so she painted her eyes uh, and adorned her head and looked out the window. Uh, and uh, I'll just give you a, a free opinion. This don't cost anything. Uh, but uh, I have heard people use this passage here where it talks about her painting her eyes in verse 30 of chapter 9 and, and say that this proves that it's wrong for women to wear makeup. And I think that's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard in my life. Uh, to, that's sort of grasping at straws to try to prove something that you want to believe. Uh, but anyway, uh, she painted her eyes and adorned her head and she looked out the window. And when Jehu got there, she... He looked up and, and she was crying treason. And uh, she, Jehu looked up and there were other, some of the officials were around her. Jehu said, who's with me? And they said, we are. So they took Jezebel and threw her down uh, from uh, the upper room, wherever she was. And it was high enough that when she hit, she splattered and her blood went up on the wall. And so they went on inside and started eating and drinking. And finally, 
Jehu said, hey, somebody needs to go bury Jezebel. And so they went back out there, and the only thing that was left was a skull in the palm of her hands. Uh, and so they just left it, didn't even bother to bury it, and said this fulfilled the prophet. If you remember what the prophet told Jehu, uh, said Jezebel uh, will, will be eaten by dogs and won't even have a burial. And so nobody could tell you where uh, Jezebel was buried. Uh, and so the corpse of Jezebel, uh, it says, fulfilled the prophecy uh, that God had given. All right, anything else on that? Chapter 10, and I'm not, I'm not going to go through it, but uh, just very briefly, uh, tells us about Jehu killing all the family of Ahab. Anybody that was re even remotely related. After he did that, he killed everybody in Israel that worshipped Baal. And so he got rid of Baal worship. Uh, he tore down the temples that had been built to Baal. Uh, and so it looked like he was going to finally be a king in Israel that was going to do what was right. However, it says, but he left the golden calves that Jeroboam had built and he continued to worship them rather than serving God. And so even though he did a lot of good things, he, he did not come back fully to God. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's being taken care of out there. Uh, time's up and somebody's gone to kid count right now. I saw them. Uh, interestingly, though, because he did do what he did in getting rid of the, the Baal worshipers, God told him that he could have four generations of his family to rule over Israel. And so he does, if he said, if you'd done completely followed me, everything like you should have, then I would have let your people be king forever. But you didn't. But you did do a lot of good. And since you did a lot of good, then your family can rule for, for four generations. All right. Uh, next week, I, Lord willing, I would like for us to, we're going to talk very briefly about the captivity. We're going to jump over the rest of the kings. Uh, we're going to talk very briefly about the captivity of Israel, the northern tribes. Then we're going to talk about the captivity of Judah. And then we're going to go to Daniel. So if you want to be reading ahead, Daniel is where you really want to go to read. All right, thank you. Who's going to ask me out? Who's going to ask me out? Oust. O U S T. Okay. Well, just for a couple minutes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Lord, for Christian. Thank you, Lord.
It might be um, the one that we've already got. Is the one I'm looking for. It's like okay. Just I've got it at home. I'll look at it. Glad each of you are here this evening. Those of you joining us online, we're glad to have you as well. Our first song this evening will be number 473. 473. Let's see. There is a name I love.
sing verses 1, 2, and 5. Before then, I'd like to ask Brother Robert to lead us in our prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your love for us and for all that you do for us and all you give us every day. And we're so thankful we have this time together to study from your word and we ask you to help us to always be what you want us to be and to live for you. We pray for the church here at Ephesus that you'll help us to be a shining light in this community and to be the church you would have us to be. We pray, Father, that you'll be with the leaders of our country and we pray that we can have peace and that we can have continue to have the freedoms that we enjoy today. We're mindful, Father, of those who are sick and we pray your blessings on them. We pray that you'll be with those who have lost loved ones and give them peace and comfort that only you can give. Help us, Father, as we go through the rest of this service to have our thoughts trained on you and set on serving you and pleasing, be pleasing to you. Forgive us when we do wrong, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. chapter 1 verse 16 it says for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek that's the power I think of today God has 
has provided you and I with the power to save ourselves. And you wonder, is God thinking what we think sometimes? Well, I've given them everything that they need. Why don't they just save themselves? I volunteered in uh, Huntington's Volunteer Fire Department along with Joel and uh, several others that used to be here for about six years. And I never seen one person that was in dire need of help that refused. But that's exactly what life, that's exactly what we do when we live in sin. We are refusing the one and only thing that can save us. God's word is power. It can save you. It will save you. And the only way that it can save you and will save you is if you invite God into your heart to stay for good. Is there anybody here that needs to respond to the gospel. If, if there is, when we sing this song, come forward and we will pray with you and pray for you and do the appropriate things. If there is anyone here that has done wrong and uh, is private, wait till you get home. Go on your private party house and pray, pray to God. He'll forgive you. So if you are in need to respond to this invitation that we ask that you would come while we stand along the same. Oh, do not let the word depart and close thy eyes against the light.
Uh, he is not doing well. He is one step from, from uh, being put on a ventilator. That's how serious it is. So please keep Billy in your prayers. Uh, Billy has done a lot of soul searching during this. Uh, he has actually called more than one of us, but he has called and, and uh, says he, he wants to do what's right. And he, is, he was baptized years ago. Uh, and he wants to do what's right. And he's asked for forgiveness. <coughs> and we pray uh, with him. Uh, so far as I understand what the Bible teaches, Billy is saved right now. He's been forgiven of his sins. But needless to say, he has not been faithful for many years, and he needs a lot of encouragement. And he does plan to come back. I'm going to use this word, when he gets out of the hospital, not if he gets out of the hospital. Uh, but do please keep Billy in your prayers, uh, regardless of how the outcome comes out of it. Uh, he, he needs a lot of strength and encouragement right now and it complicates things those of you who had family members uh, in the hospital with this can't go visit them can't go and you know eye to eye contact with them it really makes it more difficult to encourage them so please uh, keep Billy and all, all from that are sick uh, in your prayers are there any other announcements that need to be made I will mention uh, Buddy Chambers' uh, funeral was this afternoon, and uh, we uh, need to continue to keep that family in our prayers. Uh, is there anything else? Let's bow. We'll give a close of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Dear God, we thank you so much for your love for us. We know, Father, that you care for us in the good times and in the bad. We know that you help us with our struggles in life. And when we are sick, we know, Father, that we can pray to you. And we know that you have the healing power. And we pray that your will will be done in all things. But if it be your will, we pray that Billy will be healed. And all those that we know of uh, in our minds, we pray for Brother Matt will be uh, healed. And all of our uh, church family that's dealing with various illnesses, we pray that you would heal each one if it be your will. And in all things, Father, we pray that your will will be done, and we pray, we pray that you'll help us to look beyond this life, Father. Help us to look for that time that we can come home and live with you in heaven and be in a place that there will be no more sickness and no more death and no more struggles that we have uh, making from day to day in this life. Continue to encourage us and strengthen us and bring us back at the next appointed time, if such there be. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 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 Well, you're fine because Dad's immune and I'm immune. So. Okay. Okay. Uh,